Okay, um, I think we'll, we'll kick off now. We're, we're slightly behind schedule, but luckily I uh, uh, ran out of time composing my introduction, so that should fit together quite well. Uh, we've just got Nicholas Prassas, who will be speaking later in the parallel sessions, dishing out some handouts to Professor Cottingham's talk, uh, which will be beginning uh, at 11, just after I say a few words by way of introduction. Um, so first of all, welcome everyone. It's, it's really marvellous to have you here. We're extremely grateful to everyone for, for going to the effort of getting here uh, and joining us today. Um, we've got a brilliant lineup of speakers, as you're all aware, uh, waiting to be listened to, so I'll uh, keep my own talk brief. I'm just going to make a few practical announcements. Followed by that, I'll say a couple of words about the Humane Philosophy Project, Humane Philosophy and this uh, occasion's theme, Humane Philosophy and the Arts. Um, so by way of practical announcements, uh, hopefully you'll all have a copy of our conference programme. And you've probably noticed that some of these have a picture on the front of a Hellenistic bust of Homer, whereas others have a picture of a work of art by the contemporary American artist Jeff Koons. Any of you who were at our pilot event last year will be aware but this continues a tradition uh, we have of using two contrasting pictures to illustrate uh, uh, the topics of our conferences. If, if you need more handouts, there's, there's plenty there. Uh, I won't say anything about the contrast between the two, but I should reassure you that the contents of both programmes are identical, so you only need one, uh, and indeed we might run out if you take two. If you do want one with the alternative cover, you'll have to find someone to swap with or, or wait until the end. Um, so the programme contains a schedule for the day's events uh, and information on all our keynote speakers and uh, abstracts for all of the talks to be heard today. Uh, all of the keynote talks will take place here in the Aula of Blackfriars Hall. Uh, as you'll have noticed, there are also parallel sessions after lunch. Half of these will take place here in Blackfriars Hall. That's the group we've assigned arbitrarily the name A. Uh, and half of them will take place next door at St Cross College. Uh, in the St. Cross room. In order to get there, you just come out of Blackfriars at the front where you entered, go left, and the first door you'll come to on your left is the correct one to go into St. Cross. My colleague Mikawai will be there to guide you and direct you to the room in St. Cross, and I'll be there chairing, so it should be very easy to get there at that time. Uh, you can move between the parallel sessions if you like during the time to talk, just try to do so courteously and quietly. Uh, so my second practical announcement is the uh, uh, regrettable news which some of you have heard already that uh, Lord Stuart Sutherland has had to cancel late on in the arrangements for this conference it was an unavoidable circumstance that led to this obviously we apologise for this uh, reduction in the programme which is only barely and slightly ameliorated by allowing us to start at this slightly more Christian hour finally uh, uh, Regarding practical arrangements, I should say that in a departure from our pilot event last year, we haven't given out name badges to participants. This year we're trying out a new system. If you want to find out someone's name, we suggest you, you approach them, <laughs> announce yourself, perhaps extend a handshake, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll return the favour. <laughs> uh, just one final practical arrangement. As you all know, Blackfriars Hall is also a Dominican priory, Therefore, please treat the place with appropriate respect, understanding that this is a religious house, there's a community who live here. The main practical consequence of that is that outside in the hall there, you can come down as far as where the tea and coffee is being served, but don't wander off into a, 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 that direction, or you might be recruited into the uh, Dominican order. <laughs> so with the practical arrangements out of the way, I'll just say a few things about the Humane Philosophy Project. Uh, so, unofficially, the Humane Philosophy Project began a year ago with the pilot colloquium I've mentioned, uh, and this was organised by uh, my colleague Mikhail sofkowski roda of the University of Warsaw, myself, uh, and Alicia uh, Geschinska uh, of the University of Ghent then, Princeton now. This event took place at Blackfriars Hall. We felt that it was an unparalleled triumph and a landmark event in 21st century philosophy. Uh, and the uh, three institutions which supported that event, Blackfriars Hall, the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion, 
and the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw have very kindly extended their support for a three-year project developing our activities. We've had the very great honour of recruiting the organisational assistance of Dr. Przemek Burszka of the University of Warsaw. Uh, and we've also been uh, talking with Jonathan Price of the University of Leiden about the possibility of extending some activities even further across Europe. So we've already had a seminar occurring at the University of Warsaw and a one-day colloquium there. This event marks the inaugural part of the three-year projects in Oxford. Uh, and we have a film seminar arranged for next year and more conferences and events already planned for 2015-2016. Uh, regarding humane philosophy, I might have been getting ahead of myself saying all this when some of you are perhaps wondering what humane philosophy is. Professor Cottingham will shortly uh, uh, outline this far more competently and with far greater authority than I can host to. But I'm just going to make a couple of points about what humane philosophy is and, and why we've adopted this as the uh, uh, ongoing theme for our project. Um, to begin with, there are two essays which are certainly worth consulting in order to give yourself an idea of where the idea of humane philosophy comes from. Uh, uh, these are Bernard Williams' essay, Philosophy as a Humanistic Discipline, which is the titular chapter of a, uh, a 2005 collection of essays by Williams uh, uh, published under the editorship of Professor Adrian Moore. The second, chronologically, but perhaps closer in relevance to the uh, genesis of our project, is Professor John Cottingham's 2009 article, What is Humane Philosophy and Why is it at Risk? Uh, that essay is probably the starting point uh, uh, for anyone who wants to get a sense of what we're attempting to do with our project. And as I said, Professor Cottingham will discuss some of his views in this area shortly. Uh, I'll just make two suggestions as to what humane philosophy is or, or how we might understand the idea of humane philosophy, one positive and one negative characterization. Uh, so my positive suggestion is that humane philosophy is philosophy that is alive to human interests or human concerns. Uh, this characterization obviously depends heavily on the notion of a human concern which I won't attempt to uh, uh, define with any rigour here, uh, I'll, I'll just say that there's an obvious intuitive sense in which, for example, the mechanism by which a noun phrase refers to its reference is not in any direct way a human concern, although it is a theoretical problem. By contrast, how we ought to face death is in an intuitive sense a human concern. Now, it won't be any news to many of the people here at least that uh, in 20th century Anglophonic philosophy, at least, the former topic has received far more attention than the latter, and it's far more paradigmatic of the kind of thing that people have discussed. This is obviously a parochial point. I would certainly be inclined to the view that on the continent and outside of the Anglosphere, uh, uh, the abandonment of human concerns has been of a distinct character and perhaps less pronounced. Another way to uh, illustrate the idea of... Uh, the relevance of human concerns to philosophy would be by comparing two quotations from J.L. Austin on the one hand and Aristotle on the other. So I sometimes like to report the anecdote according to which at a seminar in Oxford a student once asked J.L. Austin what's the importance of any of this? To which Austin replied importance isn't important truth is important. Uh, whilst I appreciate the wittiness of that retort I think that the implication that no subject is of greater philosophical importance or urgency than any other is entirely wrong-headed. And so I'd like to contrast this quotation uh, with Aristotle in the De Anima 402a1-3, where he says, We regard all knowledge as beautiful and valuable, but one kind more so than another, either in virtue of its accuracy or because it relates to higher and more wonderful things. So the Humane Philosophy Project is, in a sense, Aristotelian as opposed to Austinian in this respect. Uh, so my positive characterization of humane philosophy was philosophy alive to human concerns. My negative characterization would be the suggestion that humane philosophy is philosophy that doesn't model itself on science. Now, this is less informative than the positive characterization, 
However, I think it might be useful in bringing out one of the main ways in which a humane approach to philosophy would depart from the dominant approach in Anglophonic 20th century uh, uh, philosophy and indeed uh, the dominant worldview or outlook in intellectual culture more broadly. So it's long been felt, at intervals at least, that the dominance of science in philosophy has had a deleterious effect. Uh, Scottish poet, translator and critic Douglas Ainsley expressed in his uh, 1909 introduction to Croce's Aesthetics this view when he said, uh, empirical science with the collusion of positivism has stolen the cloak of philosophy and must be made to give it back. <coughs> and that's by no means the earliest expression of such a view. Why the intellectual hegemony of the sciences, and in particular the physical sciences, should be troubling to philosophers interested in humane concerns, uh, I, I hope is in part obvious. And I think it's nicely illustrated by uh, uh, Leo Tolstoy when he says, experimental science, including mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, physics, botany, and all the natural sciences, is exclusively occupied with things that have no direct relation to human life. It diverts attention from the really important subjects to the insignificant subjects. That might be somewhat hyperbolic or polemical, and I'd hasten to emphasize that I don't think we should think of humane philosophy as hostile to science, but rather as complementary to it. Uh, nonetheless, it expresses a general thought which many people have had, and which I hope strikes us as somewhat intuitive or familiar. And I would suggest that philosophy that only deals in the subjects taken uh, uh, by the empirical or, or physical sciences to the exclusion of other areas and approaches would be not merely scientific, but scientific and therefore worthy of opposition. Um, I'll conclude by saying something briefly about uh, the subject we're, we're looking at today, uh, the arts. Um, so we decided for practical purposes that we should divide the activities of the Humane Philosophy Project into three somewhat arbitrarily selected uh, areas. The first of those is Humane Philosophy and the Arts, the second, Humane Philosophy and Human Nature, the third, Humane Philosophy and Scientism. It, it used to just be Art, Human Nature and Scientism, but uh, one of our advisors said it was better for the brand to repeat Humane Philosophy in all of these. Uh, so perhaps the obvious starting point for the history of the relationship between philosophy and the arts would be Plato's banishment of the poets in the Republic, uh, and in particular uh, his claim there and in the laws that there's an ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy. Ancient, even in those days. Uh, this might be contrasted to Aristotle's claim in the Poetics that philosophy has an affinity to poetry uh, in that it deals in universals rather than in particulars. Uh, so in Aristotle here, we have a suggestion, an early suggestion, of how the arts might be considered of philosophical relevance, of import, although a suggestion perhaps could do with development and fleshing out. In Plato, at least as he's usually interpreted, we have a rather unconvincing, even puritanical attack on the arts, and on poetry in particular. But that might not wholly capture Plato's view. After all, Plato doesn't only devote his efforts to the side of philosophy in discussing the quarrel, extolling philosophy and banishing the poets. Uh, he also says in several dialogues that poetry is divinely inspired, and he himself writes in a masterfully poetic style, uh, the dialogue form, the charming characters, the colourful myths, and even the uh, rare burst of verse. Uh, the sense that poetry stands as something of a rival uh, to philosophy persists in the history of philosophy, there's an interesting and perhaps unexpected example in the work of Descartes. He writes, It may seem surprising to find weighty judgments in the writings of the poets rather than the philosophers. The reason is that the poets were driven to write by enthusiasm and the force of imagination. We have within us the sparks of knowledge as in a flint. Philosophers extract them through reason but poets force them out through sharp blows of the imagination so that they shine more brightly. And of course there are further examples which we uh, mentioned in the advertisements for our event. Benjamin Jowett's comment in his introduction to Republic where he says he worries his audience will find very foreign the idea of any conflict between poetry and philosophy. T.S. Eliot's comment barely a century later that the two had always been uneasy bedfellows. 
uh, uh, and so forth. So we decided that it was probably uh, appropriate that the Humane Philosophy Project should attempt to re-examine the relationship between philosophy and the arts and take the arts as a starting point in our attempt to do humane philosophy. Uh, so I hope that provides a useful introduction to the project, to the uh, overarching theme and to today's theme in particular. Uh, I'll just mention what, what talks we have on today. The first talk, which I'll introduce in just one moment, is of course uh, Professor John Cottingham, who not only gave us the term humane philosophy, but also that translation of Descartes I just quoted as well, I think. Uh, and, and, and he'll develop, I, I hope, some of the ideas I've touched upon now, and, and I also hope won't contradict many of them vehemently. Following this, uh, we have scheduled Louise Hansen to uh, uh, look at the perennial question of the reality of the aesthetic, uh, uh, and in comparison to the reality of the moral. Following this, there's lunch. Then we have a large number, six parallel papers, looking at all sorts of topics on the intersection between philosophy and the arts. Uh, now, we mentioned in the conference advertisement we'd also try to secure some talks of more general interest to the Humane Philosophy Project. Uh, and I'm very pleased to announce that we will have uh, uh, Professor Colin McGinn talking about his general theory of human psychology and Professor Zofia Roszynska uh, uh, talking about uh, the recognition of a cultural crisis. Uh, we'll then have one more break for tea and coffee, and then conclude with Roger Scruton, who is, of course, himself a humane philosopher and a philosopher of art, uh, who has uh, uh, composed operas, novels, uh, and has spent much of his career attempting to communicate the import of the arts to the philosophical community. <laughs>